Hey, brothers and sisters, welcome to another time of Bible teaching. Yes, that means get out the Bibles. We want to look at things from Scripture. Comments. Comments are awesome. I love them. I love answering questions. A lot of times I do videos based on those questions. It just gives me the emphasis, the desire, the, the material to do. And it's like, okay, if somebody's got a question, I guarantee you I know that other people have that same question. And this video is a result of something somebody put on my on one of the comments. It wasn't necessarily a question. They gave me a list of their beliefs that was, you know, huge, just huge. And it gets deleted because if there's something in there that's not right, then I have no choice but to delete it. Um, and it's not that I'm trying to be mean or whatever to somebody. Um, it's just that, I, you know, I feel responsible for the content that's on my YouTube channel. Some stuff I let slide. If I can think I can talk to somebody and reason with them, that's a different story. Um, some people want to be rude, nasty, whatever, and they just get deleted, you know, blocked from the site, whatever. It is what it is, you know. Um, it doesn't bother me. It doesn't affect me. I realized a long time ago, if I'm going to get into ministry, I'm going to get into doing this. I need to have hippopotamus skin. It's the most the thickest skin that's known to mankind, hippopotamus skin. Um, and not let things bother me. And I just know that I'm working for God, and I'm going to keep doing what he tells me to do. All right, let's get to this. We want to look at overcomers. It's a beautiful thing. Overcomers. See, whoever comes to the world, oh, my goodness, and the promises that we get, they are awesome. But the problem is people need to understand the book of Revelation, and they don't necessarily, a lot of them. And this comment comes from somebody saying that uh, Philadelphia is the only church that gets raptured. I've heard that. And I can understand how somebody might think that. Hmm. Go get my coffee this morning. Um, Philadelphia is the only church that doesn't have a complaint against it. I need to pull something up here real quick. My list of things. Yeah, because sometimes I get the wording wrong. I forget words, whatever. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to look at those letters to the churches. All right. But there's a few things you got to understand before we get into it. So let's open up our Bibles and pull up the book of Revelation. We're going to start at the beginning in Revelation 1. No, we're not going to work our way all the way through the book of Revelation. Let me see something real quick. Make sure it's still there. Yeah. Sorry about that. I um had worked on a, I think I got through chapter 12 or 13. I was some time ago, I was doing a Bible study through the book of Revelation. And I got halfway through and it just got to a point at that point in time, there just didn't seem like that much interest. So I stopped doing it. Um, always thought about picking it back up, but you will find a playlist from some time ago where I walked through the book of the Revelation, um, uh, verse by verse. And again, I think I get somewhere up to around, um, chapter 13. Well, I've actually learned some more things about chapter 12 and 13 since that time, which I have shared. Um, with that said, when I, I study each of the, the letters to the churches, I did a 30 to 45 minute Bible study on each of the letters because there's been so much in there. So, and I thought I was going to come in here and make a real short video just to get straight to the point and give it to you. And I can't do that. So hang with me. I think it's going to be worth it. I think it's going to be a really, really cool Bible study to see what it is, the promises that God has for us as overcomers, and what it means to be an overcomer. Um, and again, that's what we're going to we're going to do. The promises first, but again, the outline in Revelation one, verse nineteen, John gives you a little bit of an outline, a short outline. Here we go. Write the things which you have seen, the things which are, and the things which will take place after this. Okay, so you have three things. The things you have seen, that's chapter one, the, the vision. The things which are, that's chapters two and three. John is writing about 90 AD in the church age. So in the letters are represent the church age. The things that will take after these things, the things which will take place after this, after the church age. That's Revelation 4 on. So let's go quickly to Revelation 4, verse 1, and see what it says. 
No, that's Revelation 1. Sorry about that. Give me a second. I'm like, it's not saying what I want it to say or what I know it says. After these things, after the church age, this is the rapture. Revelation 4 and 5, you are in heaven looking around at what's going on. That is right after the rapture. Revelation 6 is right after the rapture. You come back down on earth and you start the seal judgments. Okay. If Messiah would have tried to write and mix in what's in heaven and the seal judgments and everything, it had been really confusing. But Revelation 7 tells us about something else going on at the same time. Revelation 7. How does it start? After these things, I saw four angels. Da, 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 da. This Here's where we get into the 144,000. Okay. After these things, look and behold, a great multitude, which no one could number. Nations, tribes, peoples, tongues stood before the throne of God. Okay. And these are all these, what I call tribulation saints. I got somebody, this doesn't say tribulation saint in scripture. Okay. Um, I'll give you that. The words, the words together, tribulation saints aren't there. That doesn't mean it's not real. The Bible, the word Bible is not in scripture. That doesn't mean it's not real. The word Trinity or triunity is not in scripture. That word, it doesn't mean that there's not three that are one. But it specifically says here, you know, all these people standing there, right? And they're saying, salvation belongs to God who sits on the throne of our Lamb. Um, give me a second. Let me come down here. And the elders said, who are these arrayed in white robes? Keep that in mind. We're going to see white robes again. Where did they come from? Sir, you know, that's a great answer. You know, somebody's going to say, no, no, you know, you tell me. I'm not going to try to tell you. Well, I don't know. I'm more of a Peter. I might try to tell him. Um, these are the ones who came out of the great tribulation and washed their robes. Is God about laundry service? No. Uh, white robes means pure, without sin, spotless, okay, and made them white in the blood of the land. It's only through Messiah that that can happen. All right. And um, somebody, it's funny, interesting that, you know, if you think that, that you know, the tribulation saints, because they, they're just, it's, I believe that person's a post-tribber that just thinks everything's at the end. I could be wrong about that belief of his. Um, sometimes I mix up a lot of these things. So let's get on with it. Okay, so the, the, the Revelation 2 and 3, you have seven letters to seven churches. Each of the letters is addressed to, let me just pull one up, to the angel at the church of Ephesus. Well, angel is messenger, which is also one who, one who carries a message. It could be human. It could be divine. Lots of different types of angels. In this case, it's to the pastor. Each of these letters is written to the pastor, the leader, the angel, the messenger of an individual church. Yet, each of these letters will say, to he who has an ear, let them hear. Okay? To he who has an ear, let him hear. That's everybody. Now, there are some places in Scripture where you will see, to he who has an ear, to hear, let them hear. That's for somebody who gets it, somebody who's filled with the Holy Spirit. Okay? And, and we're going to be touching that in the next, I don't know, within the next month in our, our uh, Bible study in the book of Matthew that we're doing. We're going to get to that. once. Um, the blaspheming of the Holy Spirit, which is Israel corporately rejecting Messiah, happens, and Messiah just starts talking in parables. So we'll touch on more about that then. But he also says, to he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches, plural. More than one church. So these letters are not to individual churches. I know there's a lot of people who will say that these letters represent periods of time throughout human history. It's possible. I don't necessarily agree. I think it's for all of us. Okay? It is for all of the churches. And there's different elements of what goes on in different churches in each of these churches here. Actually, the actual order is the Roman mail road. All of these churches are in uh, Asia Minor, and this is the order in which the mail was delivered. Um, I wish I could sit and prove that. I can't, but 
uh, somebody who I, I really trust, my teacher, tells me that. I believe him. If you heard his teachings, you would believe that too. Somebody out there is now asking the question, I wonder who his teacher is. Uh, they're the teachings online at John 14, 15, numer numbers, 1415.org. Um, it is Creekside Messianic. The teacher there is Wayne Davis. He went through Baptist Seminary and started asking the questions, um, if God says something's forever, why, are we, why aren't we still doing it? And he was basically told, sit down, shut up, and you will eventually learn. Maybe not quite that way. Um, and he's awesome. He's an awesome teacher um, of the word. I love it. I get a lot out of it. He teaches book, chapter, verse throughout the Bible. He is not responsible for anything I say. I just want to leave that. Okay, let's get back to these, these uh, letters to these churches. There are four components to each of these letters. Each of them has, and we'll just show it to you on this one church here. Each of them has an introduction, the way that Messiah introduces himself, sort of a greeting. These are the things who holds on to the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven lampstands. Okay. Each of them has a condemnation and or, uh, a, uh, excuse me, a condemnation or a um, something good to say. I've got condemnation or condemnation. <laughs> okay. But either a compliment or a condemnation. I know your works, your labor, your patience, that you cannot bear those who are evil. And that's a good thing. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. That's a good thing. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Okay. The next thing it has is a promise or a reward. And that is, to he who has an ear, let them overhear. Um, to him who comes, I will give him the promise to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the garden of God, or the paradise of God. But it also has an ex, ex uh, and this one I should have said first, but an exhortation, something he's saying you got to do. And and the I have it, I wrote it backwards, so I have it backwards, but th that actually always comes before the reward. Um. So you have left your first love. And think about when you first fall in love with that woman that you eventually marry, and 20 years later, it's like not quite the same as it was when you first fell in love. I think of the song, you know, when a man loves a woman, all the crazy things you'll do. 20 years later, you might not do all those crazy things. But guess what God's saying is come back to the love like you loved me when you started. Remember before you've fallen, repent and do, do the first works, or else I will come and quickly remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. Keep in mind that none of these churches still exist today. They've all, they've all lost their lampstands. But, so, when you see the introduction of how Messiah presents himself, and you take all seven of those, you get a picture of who Messiah is. And if you see the promises that are given to the overcomer, to him who ever comes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. And you put all of those together, oh my goodness, you get to see the, par the, the, the promises to the overcomer. And that's what we're going to walk through. We're going to walk through all seven of those promises to the overcomers. And it's really cool. Um, and if you want to dig in further, you, there's a playlist on my um, YouTube channel from the teaching I did in Revelation a long time ago. I will just tell you, with any of my teachings, you're going to hear things you probably won't like, things you probably won't believe. The question is, what does Scripture say? Okay? Scripture trumps everything. Um, and I, there's a lot of people that just, um, you present Scripture to them, and they ignore it. And they try to use other scripture to um, say that that scripture is not true or point somewhere else. If you ever find yourself with, presented with a scripture and you ignore that scripture because of what you believe and that scripture um, contradicts what you believe, 
either the scripture is wrong or your belief is wrong. I would tend to that the belief is wrong because I know I've had to have some of my sh my pillars of understanding shattered from things that I'd always taught. But understand that if a scripture is wrong, everything that person says is a false prophet and everything gets worked out of the Bible. In other words, if, if John says something that you don't think is right, and if he's wrong in what he said, everything John wrote gets ripped out of the Bible. Yeah, we don't want to do that. All right, let me get moving on. First church is Ephesus, the loveless church. And it is the tree of life that is promised that you will, that I will give you the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Oh, I can't help when I see paradise. I think of the um, um, Hebraic hermeneutics, the four way levels of understanding scripture. Um, the Prasant, the Duresh, the Ramiz, and the Sod, and you put them all together because they don't necessarily use vowels. So you put them together and you get paradise, which is the picture of the Garden of Eden, how the Garden of Eden worked together, and that's how we're supposed to understand Scripture. So let's go back and look at Genesis 3, where we first see the Tree of Life, and just want to make one little point here, and verses 23 and 24. Why did we get kicked out of the Garden of Eden? Why did Adam and Eve get kicked out? Um, then the Lord said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, to know good and evil. And now least he put out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent out, sent him out of the Garden of the Eden so the um to till the ground from which he was taken. All right. See, yes, um, what happened when they, they they rejected what God told them? God said, hey, don't eat from this tree. Nowhere in scripture does it say an apple. We don't know what kind of tree it was. Satan said, Satan lied to him. Did God really say that? Um, yes, God really said that. Hold on one second. I want to get rid of this. Actually, I'm going to pause. Give me a second here. Hey, my apologies. That was an important phone call I had to take. But anyhow, um, so what the scripture is basically is saying that if we would have eaten by the tree of life in the current state of sinfulness, if Adam was, um, he wouldn't have been able to be redeemed because we have to die to our sins. Um, but luckily, Messiah has taken that death upon us. Um, I just want to make sure I had the right um, passage here. The, that the Romans 6.23, the penalty for sin is death. The wages of sin are death. We all sin. But Messiah offered his death for us in our place. He is the kinsman redeemer. Okay. So we're going to see this tree of life again in the book of Revelation. Revelation 22. Um, verse 2, and this is in the new heaven, new earth, going into the, uh, the, in the millennial kingdom, going into the new heaven and new earth. In the middle of the street on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore 12 fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree was for the healings of the nations. And down to verse, eh, where is it? 14. Blessed are those who do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life, and that they may enter into the gates of the city. Who is that? Those who um, do his commandments. All right, let's move on. Um, the, next the next church is Smyrna. Go back to Revelation 2. And this is the persecuted church. And by the way, see these things, the little comments up here, not in scripture. They can be misleading sometimes. So look at uh, verse 11. To, to he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. 
He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. That's a good thing. I don't want to get hurt by the second death. Um, go to Revelation 20. These are all the promises we get. We're just going to go to 14 and 15. Um, then death and Hades were cast into the lake in fire. This is the second death. Anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. That book of life is very important. This is at the end of the thousand-year millennial reign, when death and Hades get cast into the lake of fire. Um, we see this also in Isaiah 66. Um, that 22 through 24. For as the new heavens and the new earth, which I will make, shall remain forever before me. Okay, so we're going into the new heaven and new earth. So shall your descendants and your name remain. That makes me think of the new name, and we'll see that in a little bit. And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another, and from one Sabbath to another, all flesh, is that Jews or Gentile? That's all flesh, shall come and worship before me, says the Lord. So even in the millennial kingdom, the Sabbaths are still being kept. And the one moon, the new moon, the new moons represent the months, but it also represents the feast days and how they figure out the feast days. Because in Genesis 1, 14, the sun and the moon are for signs and seasons. That word seasons is not seasons of the year. It's moed. It's the appointed times of the Lord. And they will look. So we're into the millennial kingdom. And they shall go forth and look upon the corpses of the men who have transgressed against me. These are the people in the lake of fire. And their worm does not die. That's like their innermost being. And their fire is not quenched. Oh. And they shall be an abhorrence to all flesh. So during the new heaven and new earth, you'll still look down on this lake of fire and see all these people. Uh, you know, people are like, oh, no, no, it's not that bad. No, we're not going to be in fire forever. Scripture tells you that that is what happens. Okay, and we are not going to be a part of that. That's a good thing for the overcomers. Let's go to our next church. It's Pergamus. Revelation 2. And again, if you want to get more detail on all the scriptures in here, check out the, the teachings I did. And it may be a little while to answer a question I have on them. You have on them because it's been a while since I did them. We want to go to verse 17 here. By the way, repent or else I will come to you quickly and fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Sword of the, the sword of the mouth from Messiah is what he speaks with at Armageddon. The repenting is important. People go around, no, you don't have to repent. That's work. Actually, God's going to punish you if you repent because you're trying to do it your way. No, you're following God's instructions. Amazing what some people believe. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who ever comes, I will give him hidden manna to eat, and I will give him a white stone, and on the stone a new name, which no one knows except except him who receives it. That's interesting. I wonder what my name's going to be. Um, the hidden manna is Hebrews 9, 1 through 5. Let's go there. Hebrews. And you know what? It has nothing to do with who makes the coffee in the morning, whether it's he or she. Hebrews. 9, 1 through 5. Then indeed, even the, the first covenant had ordinances of divine service and of earthly sanctuary. For a tabernacle was prepared in the first part, which it was the lampstand, the table, and the showbread, for which is, uh, for which is called the sanctuary. That is the holy place, which is outside of the holy of holies. And behind the second veil 
the part of the tabernacle which is called the holiest of all, that's the holy of holies, which had the golden censer and the ark of the covenant overlaid on all sides with gold, in which were the golden pot that had the manna, Aaron's rod that budded, and the tablets of the covenant. That's what's inside of the holy of holies, inside of the ark of the covenant, which is in holy of holies. And above it were cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat of these things we cannot now speak in detail. So they don't know exactly 100% what exactly it looked like, but this is the promise about the hidden manna. This is where it was hidden. See, Messiah is going to be reigning in a temple, in his temple, in Jerusalem, sitting on the throne of David. In the midst of the children for, of Israel forever. You can read about it in Ezekiel 43, 1 and 7. If you're not part of the children of Israel, you're not with him. Seriously. The children of Israel, mixed multitude, going back to the time they came out of Egypt. A lot of people saw what Moses did and said, you know what? I'm going with that guy. I like the, their God's pretty cool. Maybe they didn't say it exactly that way. But the fact is, the Ark of the Covenant We'll be in the temple with Messiah. That's what the hidden manna is telling us. Um, the white stone, um, I can't give anything from Scripture, but I, but historic context is that in a court in Israel back in the day, well, not a day when I was there, um, but back in that day, not to be confused with the day of the Lord. Anyhow. There would be a white stone or a black stone revealed. Black, guilty, white, innocent. The white, the white stone means you are innocent, free of all the charges that were levied against you. That's a cool thing. Um, the new name. Go to Isaiah 62. I should have mentioned this earlier. Um, the book of Revelation is apocalyptic literature. It's got like 500 references to elsewhere in the Bible, probably over 500. The problem is everybody tries to, they try to read the book of Revelation and try to look at the world to see the things that are there and try to interpret it that way. It's not the way it's intended. Yet the book of Revelation is a roadmap through the end times, but the rest of the Bible is that key. If you don't understand the key, you'll never understand the map. It'd be like trying to give a, a somebody today that's never seen a map and ask them to calculate distances between places based on the little numbers and the different things when they don't understand without a key and they don't understand all that. It's just not going to happen. All right. Um, so we are at, uh, I'm sorry, 62 verses 22 and 24. Is this where we just were? Isaiah 62, 1 and 2. My apologies. For Zion's sake, what is Zion? Actually, it's Zion, not Zion. It's prophetic Jerusalem. I will not hold my peace. In Jerusalem's sake, I will not rest until her righteousness goes forth as a brightness. She's not righteous right now. But that's not. We don't have prophetic Jerusalem at this point. Her salvation is a lamp that burns. The Gentiles will see your righteousness and all the kings of glory. You shall be called by a new name, which the Lord, which uh, which the mouth of the Lord will name. Yep, we're going to be, we're going to get new names. And we are grafted in. And that's where we're going to be. We're going to be in Zion, which is prophetic Jerusalem. Let's move on. By Tyra. Let's go back. We're, I think, the last one in Revelation 2. The corrupt church. Ooh, somebody's going to come out and do good out of the corrupt church? Yeah. Let's look at verse 26. And he who ever comes and keeps my works until the end, to him I will give power over the nations. Keeps my works, really? Faith without works is dead. Okay, James tells us that. James 2.26. Where it says until the end, that's the goal. That word there is telos in Greek. It represents the goal. Like if you're playing touch football and you get to the end zone, that's the goal. 
It doesn't mean everything's over. All right. Um, let's go to Revelation 5. And let's look at the ruling the nations. Is that what it said? Wait a minute. Wait, wait. Did it say we're going to rule the nations? I will give him power over the nations. That's pretty cool. That's some power, right? Yeah, everybody's always wanted to rule the world, and we get to do that. All right. Um, thinking about an old song. Uh-huh. Everybody wants to rule the world. I know, I know, I can't say. Let's go to, what did I say, Revelation 5, verse 10. Yes, I'm probably ADHD. Get distracted easily. All right. Um, and he made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on earth. Keep in mind, this is Revelation 5. This is the raptured saints. This is not Philadelphia. In fact, this is the corrupt church. And it's really not good when you read through a lot of the stuff that was going on in this church. But they're in heaven. They've been raptured. It's not just Philadelphia that gets raptured. All right. So they're going to be kings and priests. What do kings do? Kings rule. What do priests do? They bring people to God. Um, go to Psalm 2. Um, what do I got? 3 through 6. Okay, this is Armageddon. Why do the nations rage and, and plot a vain thing, something that's not going to come to fruition? All these nations of the world. And whenever you see something that talks about all the nations of the world coming against Jerusalem, coming against God, coming against Israel, whatever, that's Armageddon. Because all the other wars, they have specific nations that are involved. And the kings of the, of the kings of the earth set themselves up, and the rulers take counsel together. They're working together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, and the Lord, the Tetragrammaton, that's God, this is a word you don't say, um, and against his anointed Messiah, saying, let us break their cords, let us, um, let us break their bonds in pieces, and cast away their cords from us. He who sits on the heavens shall laugh and holds them in derision. This is Messiah. Um, this is God. And they're looking up there like, oh, my goodness, can you see what these people are doing? Can you believe them? It's like you laugh, but it's a sad laughing kind of thing, if that makes sense. And he shall speak to him at their wrath and with his deep displeasure. He speaks, and it's over. For I have set my king on my holy mountain. He gets the, he gets the nations for his inheritance, but what else? You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. Okay, let's go back to Revelation 2. We said, we just read 26, and he who ever comes will keep and keeps my works until the end. To him I will give power over the nations. He shall rule them with an iron, with a rod of iron. And they shall be dashed to pieces like a potter's vessel. So that's what Messiah does. But we're going to be kings and priests reigning with Messiah. Okay, so that's what we have as well. So, and, and David got this. And David got it. Go to um, Psalm 27. Psalm 27 is a place that speaks of the rapture. And in my opinion, it's the most beautiful, the most eloquent, the most amazing rapture story in the Bible told in a way that only David can do it. And I don't have time to go through all of this in this video, but just um, go into YouTube, search Dave Call Psalm 27. You'll find one of the teachings I've done on this. Um, you see where it says right here, the one thing I've desired of the Lord that, that I will seek. So this is what he's going to seek. This is what he's going after. The one thing, you know, you think about uh, city slickers, you know, Curly's up there, the one thing that's important. This is David's one thing um, that I seek, that I will dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. How long is that? All the days of my life. Let's go and look, because David tells us elsewhere where that is. And we'll come right back here, so you may want to hold your spot. 
We're just going to go over to Psalm 23, verse, oh, come on, David, where is it? I'm losing my place here. Verse 6. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That forever. Actually, all the days of my life is kind of plural, if you understand and read it from the actual Hebrew. You don't get it in the word translations here. So it's the lives, that this life and the life to come. Back to Psalm 27. From the time of trouble, well, that's what, the time of Jacob's trouble, tribulation, he shall hide me in his pavilion. In other words, Messiah David won't be on earth. He's going to get raptured. He's not part of the church of Philadelphia, but he's going to get raptured, just like Isaiah said. He's going to get raptured back in Isaiah 26, 19. In the secret place of his tabernacle, he shall hide me high upon a rock. Messiah is that rock. And now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around. Bingo. That's what we came for. That means you're promoted above every, all your enemies all around you, that you're going to get promoted. David's a king, but he's going to be a king reigning with Messiah and priest. He knew this. What's actually really cool is if you look down here, therefore I will offer sacrifices of joy in his tabernacle. That word joy, you're like, okay, yeah, joy, 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 joy down in my heart. It's a little more than that. It's teruah, the sound that a shofar makes. Teruah. Pretty cool. Let's go back to Revelation. Yeah, that's the sound, the last trump, a teruah, the sound that of a shofar. Um, we're going to go to Revel back to Revelation. I think we're into chapter 3 now with our church at Sardis. The dead church. Can a dead church live? Yeah. He who overcomes will be clothed in white garments. Oh, white garments. That's cool. Go to Revelation 7. Remember we looked at that earlier? Revelation 7. Um, let me move this over. Revelation 7. We'll go there. Everybody who's coming into the millennial kingdom at any point will be clothed in white. And that is representative of having no sin, that the sin has been washed away. And that, again, is Revelation 7, 13 and 14. Um, and then one of the elders answered, saying to me, who are those that are way out? Oh, arrayed in white robes and where did they come from and i will say to him sir you know and he said to me these are the ones that came out of the great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb and messiah is the only way that sin is removed that we are there that is salvation we accept messiah but works are involved and we're going to talk about that more later that's how you walk in messiah there is Salvation, which is justification. That's how Paul describes it. It's justification. We know that the just will live by faith. That's how you walk it out. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. But let's move on and go to Revelation 19. And actually, we're going to see it right here, what I just said. Revelation 19, 6 and 7. And I heard a great voice. Excuse me, I, I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, as the sound of many waters, and the sound of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God uh, omnipotent reigns. Am I in the right place? Not that this is a bad scripture. I'm sorry, it's time to pause. Give me a second. I was only off by one verse. Revelation 19, starting in 7. Um... Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come. Do you want to be there for the marriage of the Lamb? I do. And his wife, us, has made herself ready. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright. For the fine linen is the righteous act of the saints. 
Then he said to me, Right, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true saying of God. The marriage supper of the Lamb, the wedding, we're betrothed when you accept Messiah. The actual wedding is when we're taken to Messiah's um, house, to the heaven, to those rooms in the mansion. And the wedding supper will be back here on earth. And that is, and the rap, excuse me, Rosh Hashanah is the marriage and Tabernacles is the wedding supper. There's actually a video about to come out. I think it comes out maybe Friday. It's going to come out before this. So, okay, I have to say it just came out. I record a lot of these in advance um, about the wedding, about Rosh Hashanah and the wedding feast and the wedding. So take a look at that one. Where, the next place we want to go where it talks about this garment, the wedding garment, the white robes, is let's go to Matthew 22. You know what? Give me a second. Yep, Matthew 22. Eight through fourteen. And then he said to the servants, "The wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy." Israel. Um, before go into the highway, and as many as you find, invite to the wedding. Now people are like thinking, of, "Well, you know, Israel is out of this." No, the wedding is a rapture. That's Rosh Hashanah. Israel, it's not till the midpoint of tribulation where they're going to say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That's why Satan wants to get rid of Israel. So that Israel can't say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Because Messiah said in Matthew 23, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. He can't come back until they say that. But we know they say that and because it's in Scripture that they will. Anyhow, therefore, go into the highways. And as many as you fi find, invite them to the wedding. And to the servants who went on the highways, gathered together all who were found, both good and bad, and the hall was filled with guests. But the king came to see the guests, and he saw a man there who did not have a wedding garment. He said, friend, how did you come in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Okay, you can't get into the wedding without a wedding garment. That's the white robe, the pure, the blameless, the sin free because god took messiah took away our sins but see it's the father of the groom messiah's father god that would be the one giving out the wedding garment he was speechless yeah at that point if you ain't got what you need you don't have the oil in your lamp uh you're not saved you don't have messiah there you will be speechless there is nothing you can say at that point then the king said to the servants bind his hands foot and take him away and cast them into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That would be the great white throne judgment thrown into the lake of fire, which we looked at earlier. All right. Um, go to Matthew 10. We're going to trace this one out a little further. And what do I want in Matthew 10 here? 32 and 33. Therefore, whoever confesses me before men, him I will confess before my father. Now, we're actually going back to another part of this. Okay. Um, but whoever denies me before men, him I will also deny before my father. This actually goes back to something other than the white robe. So let's go back to our verse in Revelation 3, which is you got the white robe. I will not blot his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. So let's talk a little bit about blotting the name out of the book of life. There are two thoughts about this that everybody who's saved is written in the name of is written in the book of life and and that um and that's it but there's another one that everybody's name was written in the book of the life and that he will blot out those who are in it 
I think I'm somewhere in between there, not 100% positive on that. But I'll tell you what, this right here takes the once saved and always saved, and you can just throw it out the window because your name can be blotted out of the book of life. But he says, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. So let's go back and read again what we just had in Matthew. Um, I know you probably can remember it, but let's do it anyhow. Matthew 10, 32 and 33. Whoever confesses me before men, him I will also confess um, before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, um, him I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. And and somebody will say, yep, see, once saved, always saved. Doesn't say anything about works here. you got to put all the scriptures together. If you're like ignoring a scripture because it doesn't fit what you believe, there's a problem there. Let's go and look what Paul says. And where do we want to go here? Um, 2 Corinthians, uh, Romans 10. Yeah, Romans 10. I need to get moving. I'm getting behind here, but that's okay. Romans 10. I think this is really cool stuff. Verse 8. If you confess with your mouth, so 10 starting in 9. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised you from the dead, you will be saved. Right, same basic thing. But read the next verse. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So you got to look at that believes unto righteousness. What is the opposite of righteousness? We don't have to guess, Paul. Tell us what it is. Go to 2 Corinthians 6. Verse 14. Do not be unequally yoked together with uh, believers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? For what communion has light and darkness? Light and darkness are opposites. Righteousness and lawlessness are opposites. So you can't be operating in lawlessness and be in righteousness at the same time. Lawlessness. Oh, I missed it here. Anemia. Probably what it's going to say. Oh, I'm sorry. Give me a second. Unrighteousness. Sorry, there it is. The anemia. It's the condition of being without law, without Torah, because of ignoring it, because of violating it. Contempt and violation of law, iniquity and wickedness. If, if that one is blowing your mind, look at all the verses about lawlessness. It will really blow your mind. All right, let's move on. Um, the Church of Philadelphia. And I get that people think this is the only church that anybody's going to come out of and do well from. We see that's not the truth. Because this is the only church that doesn't have a condemnation about it. So it's Revelation 3, and we're going to look at something interesting. And I'll give you this. <laughs> he who has the key um, okay. and to the angel of the church in Philadelphia these are the things he who is holy he who is true Messiah he who has the key to David and he opens and no, what he opens no one shuts and what he shuts no one opens Messiah is going to sit on the throne of David and the open door represents the rapture on Rosh Hashanah it's the day that the doors are open the gates are open in Revelation 4, 1, he saw a door to heaven that was open. All right, skip down to um, 12. See who ever comes. I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more. I will write on him a name, my name, the name of the city of my God. The new Jerusalem, which comes down from heaven, and my God, and I will write on him my new name. We read about the new name, before we're not going to go back there, 
because I'm just short on time, but what we saw back in the Church of uh, Pergamos, um, 62-2, verse 2. The, 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 pillar, the pillar is the pillars. It's what holds everything up, okay? In the pillar would be a peg, and they would put a peg on there. And it's Zechariah 10.4 uh, that talks about this. Um, it's too much to explain right now. That peg is Messiah, and all the implements hang on it. But it connects us with the peg and all the implements in the Holy of Holies, like hanging on it. It's really cool. Um, we did. There is a Bible study in the book of Zechariah down in the playlist. It's um, and again, this is Zechariah ten verse four. Check it out. Let's move on. Laodicea. What's interesting is people, and again, Revelation three. Actually, just go further down. The Church of Laodicea, um, lukewarm. What does that actually mean? Obviously, you know what lukewarm is. That's like the temperature you want to wash your hands with. It's interesting. When you look at the definition, though, tempid, lukewarm. Metaphorically, the condition of one's soul wretchedly fluctuating between a torpor and a fervor of love. Remember, go back to the, you know, the way you first loved God. Um, but a torp torpor is like sloth-like, um, comatose, dead. So it's a combination between the two. At this point, um, Laodicea had two sources of water. One that came from an area where the water would have been hot. One was from the mountains where it would have been cold or cool. By the time it got there, both sources were lukewarm. doesn't help much. It's not as good. So much I could say about this. This is mixing things that are pagan with things that are of God. Things that cause death with things that bring in life. And yes, our churches are bringing pagan things into them and worshiping God that way. We're not supposed to do that. That's what this church does. Let's go down a little bit further and look at 21. And we've already kind of covered this one. Yep, oh, i got to go back. Verse 21, to him who ever comes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. So again, we're going to be kings and priests with Messiah and reign with Messiah. It's pretty cool. Um, let's go, and that was in Revelation 5.10 about being kings and priests. We looked at it already. And that is during tribulation. So where we want to go back to, if we want to look now at what does it mean to be an overcomer? You know, all these promises mean nothing unless we are overcomers. And who was it that wrote this? John. So let's look and see what John has to say about being an overcomer. We're going to go to 1 John 5. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And whoever loves him, who begot also loves him, loves him who begot, in other words, God, because God begot Messiah, also loves him who is begotten of him. So by itself, yeah, cool, no problem. But it's not by itself. we got to keep reading context. By this, we know that we love the children of God when we Love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Our faith is keeping the commandments, walking in it. He who overcomes the world, but he who believes, I'm sorry, who, who is he who overcomes the world? but he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Now, you could take verses 4 and 5 right here and just read those and forget about the context, and you're going to miss what John is trying to say to you. Let's go to 1 John chapter 1. 
Again, if this goes against what you believe, is scripture wrong, or is your beliefs need change, need adjusted? And again, if this scripture is wrong, what John is, oh, I'm not, that's not John, is it? Yeah, it is. If this scripture is incorrect, then you got to take everything John wrote out of the Bible, including the book of John and the book of Revelation. They're now garbage, but they're not. 1 John 1. I have 4.14. Let's see where we're going to go here. 1 John 1 verse. Give me a second. I'm sorry. Let's go to 1 John 4. I see what I did wrong. Hmm. Give me a sec. My apologies. I wrote things wrong. Go to 1 John 4. And John tells us, whoever commits sin commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. Now, you can look up this definition of sin, and it'll say missing the mark. But what's the mark? Doing good. What's good? You know, everybody's got different interpretations. John tells us the definition. Sin is lawlessness, condition of being without aura, not following God's ways, not being obedient to the Lord. Whoever commits sin commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. And you have known that he was manifest to take away our sins. Yes, Messiah is to take away our sins. In him there is no sin. Whoever abides in him does not sin. Lawlessness. Whoever sins has neither seen him nor know him. So if you are... Um, I'm not saying that, you know... It's a continual thing. If you just like have no disregard for Torah, everything else, you don't know him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Who who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. Righteous is the opposite of lawlessness. Practices, what you're trying to do. You're working at it. Doesn't mean you're perfect. For he who sins is of the devil. So if you're practicing lawlessness, you are of the devil. For the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whoever has been born of God does not sin. Sin is lawlessness. For his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin because he has been born of God. One last place in John. And this is what John talks about as an overcomer. You have to understand, John is writing after all of the other people, especially John 1, 2, and 3. And he sees what's going on in the church. He sees how this church is slowly turning away from what it was when Messiah walked on the earth. 1 John 2, starting in verse 3. By, now by this we know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. He who says, I know him, and does not keep his commandments is a liar. And the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. He who abides in him ought to himself walk just as he walked. Messiah kept Torah, kept Sabbath, the law. Um, and as John says elsewhere, imitate me, excuse me, as Paul says elsewhere, Imitate me as I imitate Messiah. And I get it. This goes against the grain of what the church teaches. And I had a real problem with this at one time. Is scripture right or are my thoughts right? That's the decision I had to come to. Take care. Thank you for watching.